community of practice. Welcome to our first webinar in our RML in Practice series. We aim to host a webinar every couple of months with speakers from the organizations and programs that we're profiling through our RML in Practice series, which you can see on the website, measuringresilience.org. Um, the RML Community of Practice is being championed and hosted by the Global Resilience Partnership, and I would like first to invite Nate Matthews, the Director of Programs at the GRP, to say a few words before we begin. Nate, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dorcas. Uh, I'll just be very brief. So um, just to say that we're, we're really excited um, to host the RML community of practice and, and really to use the next while to, to see and, and build out greater convergence and coherence between these communities. And we also really want to hear from all of you on, on thoughts on this. Uh, so how to build this out, how to um, increase the utility of this, this great community of practice and, and think about you know, where we should take it uh, into the future. Um, so looking forward to this webinar and um, I'm, unfortunately I'm stuck in another meeting so I'm, I'm having to jump out um, but I'll be looking at the recording shortly after and, uh, and Dorcas will, will of course be in touch as well. Uh, but just again, just to reiterate that uh, very excited to host this and, and see this continue on. Great, thank you, Nate. Thanks for thanks for that. And I I know that there are a number of people on the line who are community of practice members, but there are also people on the line who are partners with the Global Resilience Partnership and not yet members of the community of practice. Um, so I want to acknowledge that we have those two two communities on the line with us. And we really were um, bowled away by the number of people who registered for the for the webinar. Um, and clearly, we are hitting a, a a point of, of interest for people. So I'm just going to start by headlining that we are a community of around 250 resilience focused monitoring evaluation and learning practitioners or researchers and also programmers coming from about 90 organizations or resilience um, programs and platforms like the Global Resilience Partnership. We were formed in 2016 and the purpose of the community of practice is really to convene and stimulate collaboration among these specialists around tools and methods for uh, resilience evaluation and learning in order to generate evidence and knowledge about what works for strengthening the resilience of people, communities and systems. So we're really trying to focus on the, the development of robust and credible knowledge and evidence that strengthens the evidence base for making resilience investments. So today on the line, we have Jill Scantlin from Mercy Corps. She's the Resilience Monitoring Evaluation Research and Learning Advisor. And we have Elsa Feebles from Oxfam's Resilience Knowledge Hub, and she's the Senior Meal Advisor for Resilience. And unfortunately, Simone Verkat from the Global Resilience Partnership could not join us today, but we have Wendy Bevins from Lutheran World Relief, IMA World Health, um, who will be our discussant. So Jill will speak first, um, and then Elsa, and Wendy will uh, make some comments and ask a couple of questions, and then we will move into the Q&A at the end. Just a, a few logistics on that. Um, there are a number of people online, so we won't be able to take your questions in person, so, and we ask you to stay muted. Um, but you can use the chat box to ask questions, and we will be tracking the chat box. And then I will put those questions to speakers in the Q&A session, recognizing that we may not get to all of the questions that you pose, but they will help us shape for future webinars and newsletters. Um, and also I wanted to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and the recording and the slides will be made available on the website in the coming few days. And finally, just to make a note um, to encourage you as, you as you leave the webinar to engage with this series of RML and practice. 
You could join the community of practice if you're not already a member by um, going to the contact page on the website, measuringresilience.org. And certainly feel free to send us in other questions that you would like to see addressed in future newsletters or webinars to the info at measuringresilience.org email. And you may actually be somebody who would like to have their organization or pro program profiled in the RML and practice series. So again, just send us an email and we can follow up with you. So I am going to turn over to Jill Scantlin. Um, Jill, can you unmute yourself and share sure. your screen? Yes. Thank you. All righty. Let me just make sure that we can all see the presentation. Yes, I can see it. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining uh, this morning or afternoon or wherever you're calling in from. Um, again, my name is Jill Scantlin and I am the resilient, all these different acronyms that we have at Merle, Monitoring, Evaluation, Research and Learning Advisor for Mercy Corps. Um, so what I'm going to do today is going to give a brief overview of Mercy Corps' approach to resilience, monitoring, evaluation, and research and learning um, with the main theme throughout the presentation being what do we need to do differently in resilience programs regarding measurement. So first of all, um, I'm going to describe Mercy Corps, well really the story behind why we pivoted our approach to development and decided to go all in on resilience um, as an organization. Um, I'll then talk about how this led to uh, an investment in RML and what this looks like at Mercy Corps right now and in the, in the past and right now. Um, and finally, I'll discuss some kind of some ongoing challenges we're facing um, as an organization and some potential solutions for those challenges. So in the story behind Mercy Corps' focus on resilience really began in 2011 um, with the Horn of Africa drought. So it, as many of you remember, um, you know, Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, Djibouti, the Horn of Africa experienced a devastating drought. Um, and despite early warning signs and a history of drought in this region, a food crisis still unfolded that affected about 13 million people and caused over 200,000 deaths. And this picture was taken around, I think, the height of the drought in Ethiopia in 2011. It really exemplifies some kind of the barren landscape that many of the communities we were working um, in were facing. And so given that this disaster unfolded despite the heavy investment and in development in this area, this really um, made Mercy Corps kind of look inward and a lot of other organizations um, as well. And we were sort of thinking, well, if this was an avoidable disaster, we really need to rethink the normal ways of doing the work that we're doing so we can avoid this failure again in the future. And so Mercy Corps and other agencies really began to ask, well, how can development assistance be designed and delivered differently to reduce humanitarian need and advance long-term goals despite these reoccurring shocks and stresses? And so from this, um, Mercy Corps' resilience approach was born. So the way that I like to describe, or a lot of us at Mercy Corps like to describe our resilience approach um, is through these three arrows diagrams. And so I'm gonna kind of go through that with you all. Um, so the first diagram here represents kind of a typical development approach. So you'll see that, you know, maybe the green arrow represents a well-being outcome like food security. And so the typical thinking was if we just implement our program over time, well-being is gonna go up. It's a nice picture, right? Um, but we know in reality, this is not really what it looks like. And so in reality, this is what we normally see. Um, we see that communities face multiple and severe shocks and stresses throughout their life for even a single year that threaten their development progress. And so this graph shows that with each shock and stress, so those red dots, um, backsliding occurs in those development gains. And so when you take a resilience approach, um, you think about how you need to design your interventions and activities to help communities identify and address underlying vulnerabilities, minimize exposure to risks, and strengthen resilience capacities to achieve positive inclusive change. And so this is what we realize that we need to do differently. 
And so this really inherently shows a more complex picture of what success is going to look like in your program. So maybe some communities are only able to cope with the shocks and stresses as they're happening, and you'll see a temporary dip in their well-being, but they're able to bounce back or recover. So that's sort of like the bottom two arrows showing those different trajectories. Or maybe well, we're seeing that they're able to avoid the shock altogether, um, despite you know, all odds, and they're able to draw on those different resources and their well-being is maintained, which is maybe the arrow above. So really what this is showing is that our resilience approach takes those shocks and stresses into consideration when designing interventions. And we see that there's different outcomes um, depending on how people were able to respond in, in a particular context. And so the second part of the question we asked ourselves after the Horn of Africa was that, you know, if we're able to do things differently, how do we know it actually works? And so our ability to answer this question um, really required Mercy Corps to invest in resilience measurements and resilience smell systems. So let's get into some of Mercy Corps' resilience measurement approaches and how they were developed. A rough timeline of sort of how RML has um, been invested in and developed over time at our organization. So firstly, Mercy Corps, you know, we wanted to heavily invest in research to sort of understand what really mattered for building resilience to shocks and stresses um, in the Horn of Africa in particular. And so from this research, uh, we discovered kind of some key indicators or key thing, key capacities that we thought were important. So we thought, you know, let's expand this and, and test these in other contexts that we're working in. And so in 2013, um, some, we created these resilience hubs in West and East Africa and Asia to really test our program models, conduct additional research, um, and just convene some conversations among our colleagues to understand more about resilience and what it looks like in these different contexts. And from this learning, we developed our resilience framework, um, which really emphasizes the use of the strategic resilience assessment or the stress process to explore a set of guiding questions. We'll go over this in a bit. That really frame how we should apply that resilience thinking in our portfolio. We then hired a RML advisor, that's me, in 2016 to um, take the lead in resilience measurement. And now we're really focused on um, embedding some resilience thinking into our standard practices that we do at Mercy Corps in program management and in monitoring and evaluation. Um, throughout the life cycle of the program. So um, in particular, these resilience standard practices were sort of born from learning over time what's important to invest in. And what we found that the startup period is a very important time in a program um, to sort of get things right. So we've really tried heavily to invest in this time period and trying to embed resilience thinking. I'm gonna go over some of these standard practices that uh, we use in our programs. Um, only able to just highlight a few though. So hopefully we'll get to have some more conversation about this afterwards. The first standard practice I would like to talk about is our resilience foundations course. So in, in addition to some of the a typical onboarding um, activities that Mercy Corps does, uh, we're now offering a resilience foundations course for our staff and Im implementing partners. So this is a um, two-day course that draw on Mercy Corps' learning experience and expertise of resilience. It really goes over some of those key central concepts of what is resilience. It breaks it down into easily digestible pieces um, and asks or really uses that central question, what does res a resilience approach require us to do differently as the basis for exploring basic resilience concepts and their application in foreign assistance and aid programming in different contexts. Um, You all might be familiar with Mercy Corps' uh, strategic resilience assessment approach, um, but really this, we're focused on layering risk into our contextual analyses or conducting separate risk and resilience assessments as um, a good foundation to start our programs out so we can understand what we need to focus on. Um, and so the strategic resilience assessment uses a standard process of its the scope, inform, analyze, strategize that blue bubble in the slide 
to gather information we need to design our program's intervention approach. And so we use these five resilience questions to guide this analysis, this resilience of what, for whom, to what, through what, and to what end. And this contextual information really helps us understand the systems and populations we're working within and with, the shocks and stresses we're building resilience to, the resources we need to access and use to address those shocks and stresses, and what the ultimate goal is that we're aiming for. So we use this information to develop um, resilience-focused results chains or pathways. Now, these are different um, than maybe your typical theory of change or log frame because they really detail out um, exactly how you expect your interventions to build resilience in your program. Um, they really demonstrate that visually. And so, you know, we ask questions like, what are the layered and sequence interventions and activities that will contribute to building resilience capacities? What resources are you building access to and use of to prevent, anticipate, cope, um, or absorb shocks and stresses? How do you expect um, people to use those resources um, to avoid the shock effect or the, the shock itself? And what changes do you anticipate seeing in those development outcomes? So it's, it's a very detailed, I guess, theory of change um, for your resilience program. And you go through a facilitated exercise that helps get everybody in your program on the same page about how you're building resilience. You also use this tool throughout the program life cycle to sort of reflect on um, your progress made using data. And we try to embed this in our review and reflection sessions as often as we can. This is an example of what it looks like, um, maybe a, a simplified example, um, just to sort of give you a reference. I won't be able to go over this now, but in case you want to sort of dig into this a bit later to see what it really looks like in practice. And then finally, um, I wanted to talk about our recurrent monitoring surveys and some of the research and valuation we're doing. Um, so recurrent monitoring surveys are an important resilience standard practice for measuring the impact of our programs over time. Um, we also call these RMSs. Um, so the RMS tracks the same individual and households over time so we can see how they respond to shocks and stresses as they're happening and how this impacts their well-being. And this is different than your typical baseline inline because usually um, those are different cross-sectional surveys where you have different populations. You're just, just getting one slice in time, just sort of seeing what it's like in the beginning and the end. What this really does is it's following the same cohort of individuals over time. And so you can sort of see how they're drawing on those different resources to respond to shocks and stresses in real time and getting that data as the program is going along. Um, another key feature of the RMS surveys uh, is that we're able to leverage these oftentimes um, for research and evaluation. And if we have really robust participant uh, data, we're actually able to test which packages of interventions lead to the greatest outcomes. We've been able to do this in several of our programs. Um, and most recently in our Food for Peace funded program in Nepal, we were able to understand what has the greatest impact per dollar spent through a cost benefit analysis at the project level. So that's an exciting new innovation in um, our ability to understand what really works. So some of the challenges. I'm sure these are similar challenges that you all face um, when you're trying to implement resilience monitoring and evaluation and learning in your program. Some of the main pain points for Mercy Corps have been, um, well, you know, purposely integrating resilience measurement at the startup. So this is something that we know it's important to get it right in the beginning, but really making that um, argument of the added value of doing it in the beginning, it's a, you sometimes you know, it's a big investment in a lot of cases to, uh, to kind of go all in and all, some of these measurement um, approaches. And so what we're really trying to do is develop this package of standard practices that we can sort of say to our chiefs of parties or our country directors, hey, look, this is what we can offer. Here's what it's going to result in. Um, but in the past, we've had, you know, and still really struggle with trying to really purposely integrate that measurement in the beginning. Um, another challenge is that those theories of change or results chains are 
resilience pathways or whatever you want to call them um, that I went over. Sometimes, um, you know, they, you're developing them in the beginning and you're really excited about them, but then you kind of fail to use them throughout the program cycle and they sort of sit there um, and they're not used as adaptive management tools. So that's something we're trying to embed more and more um, into, you know, the quarterly reviews or into those review and reflection sessions and trying to really get them to be an iterative um, living document that you can use to reflect and learn from. Another key challenge is that uh, sometimes when you're developing these resilience measurement tools and systems, uh, because they're different than the typical monitoring, um, they can create parallel MEL systems in a program, which is not helpful because it just is more work for everybody. Um, so again, we're really trying to look at our standard MEL practices and say, well, what do you have to do differently for a resilience program? And just trying to hone in on making those key changes within the existing systems instead of introducing you know, a parallel system. Another challenge I think with the recurrent monitoring surveys is because they collect so much data, um, it's difficult to decide how to balance, you know, what's good enough to make decisions um, versus what's rigorous enough to show impact. And that balance, you know, it's depending on the goals of the program or um, maybe the, how long you have to be able to demonstrate that impact. It, it's, it's, it's been a challenge um, for some of our teams to decide, you know, what's that balance. And then finally, a related challenge, recurrent monitoring surveys can be quite a heavy lift. Um, at times and I think there's really a need to develop some more simple um, light touch monitoring tools that teams can use um, in in the case where they don't have the budget or the time to do these large recurrent monitoring surveys. So I'm going to stop there um, and you know pass it on to my colleague uh, Elsa who's going to talk about Oxfam's approach to resilience measurement. Thank you, Jill. That was, um, that was really great. And actually, as someone who's collaborated in various ways with um, Mercy Corps since 2011, it's just been tremendous to see how the organization's thinking has evolved from well, what is resilience about to how do we measure and understand it um, through to you know, tools for training and, and orienting staff. So really mainstreaming that thinking about resilience and resilience mail with across programs. Um, so I really appreciate hearing about that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, I'm sure you have uh, questions. So I invite you to put those in the chat box and we will be tracking them and using them to um, ask questions when we've finished. Apologies because I'm having a slideshow snafu. Um, and I will invite Elsa to come and talk about Oxfam's experience. Elsa, you on the line? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this conversation. So as my colleague, I'm going to present you an overview of Oxfam approach to resilient development and, and how this approach is also making a difference of how we are and uh, doing a meal monitoring evaluation, social accountability and learning in our resilience building interventions. I'm going to finalize uh, also with which are the challenges we, we actually we, we currently find found and 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 yeah and how we are addressing those. So you, yeah thank you. So um, we can say that the Axon journey on resilience mill started uh, around 2012. Um, when we uh, started to have a broad understanding of resilience with a multidimensional approach based on five dimensions that was used for resilience building programs and impact evaluations, what we call uh, the resilience effectiveness review. In 2015, Oxfam started a learning journey to better understand and conceptualize resilience and improve the way we delivered resilience building interventions across the confederation. So in 2016, building from Oxfam experience across geographies, we defined a common understanding and approach that we ex explain in the framework and guidance for resilient development that you see here in, on the slide called the future is a choice. From there on, 
we continue to develop and deepen different elements of this approach. For instance, in 2017, gender justice and what has to do with resilience, exploring the relationship between gender justice and resilience and how to apply gender and power lenses in practice. In 2018, we deepened on meal for resilience, exploring, to what, exploring what the Axum approach to resilient development meant for our meal practice and how we should be doing meal for resilience programming. So beside these main conceptual and practical products, Axum Journey on Resilience and Resilience Mail has much more learning from our practice in applying these approaches through resilience project evaluations, meta-analysis, amateur reviews, and several learning products throughout the confederation. So after this introduction, I will uh, let you know a little bit more about the Oxmo approach to resilience, which is informing how we approach our monitoring evaluation accountability on learning practice. So first of all, we want to say that uh, the way we, we, we frame it is that resilience is not an ultimate desired goal or outcome. So we are, want resilient and sustainable development. That is a development that does not cause or increases risks, stresses, and volatility for people living in poverty, and which makes progress towards just and world, a just world despite shocks, stress, and uncertainty. So we use this to call Resilient Center a definition of nine planetary boundaries that allow humanity to develop and prosper. Together, they comprise the environmental sailing. But there is also a social foundation below which life is unacceptable for humans. So between the environmental selling and the social foundation is the safe and just space for humanity. This is the space for inclusive, sustainable and resilience development. So next slide, please. So how, how we, we define resilience? So Oxon have a standard definition that is the ability of women and men to realize their rights and improve their well-being despite shocks, stresses and uncertainty. Another way to see it is that resilience is about enhancing the capacity to proactively and positively manage change in ways that contribute to a just world without poverty. There are three types of resilience capacities, absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacity that need to be enhanced to achieve resilient development outcome, outcomes, that is the realization of rights and well-being in spite of shock, stresses, and uncertainty. So next slides go more into the detail on which are the main features of our Oxfam approach to resilience and resilience development. The first point I want to stress is that this approach understands inequality and equal power dynamics as a root cause of risk and vulnerability. So that means that we acknowledge agency, empowerment and choice of vulnerable people. So we frame resilience as a set of capacities. We tackle gender inequalities, consider other intersection power dynamics. Dynamics. We also, this approach, take an holistic and systemic approach. We mean that we take a multi-risk approach. So we should be building resili resilience to a multi multiple shocks and stresses that uh, affect people living in poverty. We break in silos across sectors, silos within the organizations. For instance, what we call the one program approach, where uh, we merge humanitarian development and influencing and campaign work or the nexus approach in fragile contexts. Also combining short and long-term visions, multi-level approach, all this, uh, all, this, uh, all this is what we understand as uh, taking an holistic and systemic approach. So as I said, resilience is not an ultimate goal, but a continuous process to build a set of capacities. And uh, you see here in the, in the right uh, part of the slide, some uh, diagrams, in fact, that show the four key pathways uh, we, we have framed uh, that inform our programs uh, to be resilient development. The first one, that is the blue circle you see uh, in the diagram, is working collaboratively with multiple stakeholders groups to create solutions. We need to build an understanding of the content on the context, exploring three challenges, adaptive challenging, humanitarian challenge, and justice challenge, the red bubbles in the diagram. We need to design for the long term to advance six social change processes. I'm going to go to the details, but you see the three, uh, the six uh, purple bubbles in the middle. And then we make uh, the emphasis on iterative learning and ongoing adaptive management of our interventions. 
All these pathways, all these pathways are context specific and aim to reinforce the absorptive, adaptive, and transformative capacities of peoples and systems. The three capacities are broadly used in the sector, so several organizations and institutions also frame resilience as a set of three capacities. Surely, we can say that absorptive is about coping, so short term. Adaptive is about flexibility and choice in the medium and long term. And transformative is about power. Thus, transformative capacity involves intentionally generating and engaging in deep ongoing change that addresses the root causes of poverty, injustice, vulnerability, and risks. So, to finalize about the, with the Oxfam approach to resilience, uh, I want to stat, stress about uh, that the gender justice approach. So, bringing about structural change, we need to acknowledge the importance of gender justice and incorporate it in resilience building programming to do no harm, but also to enhance the system's resilience capacities. That means acknowledging that systemic power and balances shape vulnerabilities and risk and hence resilience capacities, as well as possession of it. So, vulnerability is determined by power and privilege. Women, men, girls and boys have distinct experiences of risks. In most cases, existing gender-based discriminations and inequalities limit women's and girls' access to key information, strategic decision-making opportunities, or the resources they will need to adequately adapt to ongoing changes. This is not accident. It is due to deep-rooted gender-based inequalities and equal power relations. So gender being one dimension of power that is struck to social inequalities, it is at play at different scales, including within the household. So we adopt the intersectional approach. It is about gender as one dimension of power intersecting with others like class, caste, age, etc. So if we move forward, though I'm going to, to deepen now on okay, how, how this approach uh, Oxfam has on, on resilience and resilient demo, development is making uh, is, is shaping or shapes our meal practice in resilience programming. So, yeah, so the, the first thing um, I want to stress is that our approach is not just focused on measurement. When we take an holistic approach to all the elements of monitoring, evaluate, evaluation and learning systems and social accountability in our programs. This is because men systems should respond to specific needs of interventions that aim to foster resilience development. And we have uh, conceptualized uh, these needs on, on three elements. The first one is to learn better and faster. By this, we mean learning iteratively throughout the world program cycle, learning with others so we can bring other perspective and knowledge into learning, to have shorter learning loops so we can detect in early stages the strategies and actions that do not work, learn continuously so we can implement the program and making decisions based on evidence and lessons learned to be able to improve program during implementation. The second need is to understand how change happens in a given context, understanding how interventions are contributing to change and what are the system's capacities needed to proactively and positively manage change, what factors and actors are also influencing this change. Finally, assess progress on resilience building. Our meal practice needs to inform how and to what extent our intervention is strengthening resilience capacities at different levels and how context dynamics uh, affect change, positively or negative. So moving, moving forward this slide, um, our approach, so we have uh, in 2018, as I said, we have um, uh, developed a, a guidance for teams to, to, to that explain a little bit the approach we have on for resilience. So to respond to these needs, our approach focuses on two elements. The first one is, is focusing on what we should be looking at in our monitoring, evaluation and learning systems. And the second element is about how we should be designing and implementing MEL systems so they can respond to those needs. So if we want to, the, with the first one, in what to look at, is this diagram you see in this slide. I'm not going to go a lot into details, but we are defining three areas of change and one focus area where our meal systems should pay attention to. So area of change one refers about tracking and monitoring processes, how actors, actors collaboration and relationship to enhance those processes. It's about monitoring and learning for adaptive management to ensure cost correction of reaction. 
area of change too, we refer and focuses uh, at looking at intermediate outcomes, that is resilience capacities, ensuring, ensuring gender differentiation. Area of change three refers to final long-term development outcomes. So it's evolving and rights over time. And finally, we have defined in bottom in red, the focus area that in fact refers about monitoring the changing context. So because resilience can only be fully understood with the occurrence of shock, stresses, and uncertainty, as uh, my colleague has already explained. So monitoring context and embedding it in all the uh, monitoring, evaluation, or learning is important to adapt interventions and to better interpret uh, the results, the success of our program. If we move, uh, go to the next slide. Um, thank you. Um, so the other element I, I just mentioned is about how how we uh, how we implement and design MEL systems. So it's not just only about what we should be monitoring, evaluating, and measurement measuring in resilience with intervention, but also about how we design and implement MEL systems. So we have defined a set of 10 guiding principles um, that, 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 that try to uh, provide guidance to teams to design their mail systems. I'm not going uh, into the details. Uh, you, will, uh, you, you can read it in the slide. Also, you can access uh, the presentation and, and read them in the, in the guide. But just to mention a few. Um, we refer, for example, to place on learning at the heart of formal practice also using a theory of change. Also, there is a principle around planning for flexibility in our programs as well in our meal, in our meal and to gender and power lenses in our meal. Also, for instances, including perspective of local stakeholders in meal using participatory methods. This speaks to the role of meal to give visibility and voice of different social groups. It is about equity. Are some programs making a difference for different social groups? So in the following slides, I will present more practical examples on how we put these areas of change and guiding principles into practice. So if we move to the next slide, I'm going to, to explain, uh, to present the case of the BRA methodology. Um, there is the vulnerability risk and capacity assessment methodology, which is a methodology we use in assessment and design phase of our interventions to analyze context context, risk, vulnerabilities, and capacities. But also we have applied to inform local policies and development plans um, to foster resilience. So shortly, this methodology has three steps. So the first one um, has a preparation phase when we explore the landscape and its stakeholders and groups, and we conform what we call the knowledge group. And that is confirmed by multiple stakeholders, including different levels of governance and vulnerable and marginalized groups. Then we convene in a three days workshops, this knowledge group, and we facilitate a safe and inclusive space to reflect and analyze about the main risk, uh, uh, the main risk and how they impact different social groups. They uh, explore as well with an exercise that is called the impact change. What are the consequences of this on the, uh, and the root causes? And finally, what are the capacities they exist, that exist and need to be reinforced? Finally, the results of this process should be documented, shared, and put into practice in program design or policy development. So this approach ensures, it's an example to show that it ensures representation of voices, allows to identify differentiated vulnerabilities, perception of risks and capacities, embraces multi-stakeholder approach, tackles power dynamics between groups and strengthening relationships, relationships between actors. Um, it's important that in order to be also, uh, yeah, also this, 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 this methodology um, uh, shows how we include a systemic perspective as it is looking at capacities at different levels of governance and systems and funding through the impact chain exercise allows to start the discussions about the root causes, opening opportunities to address the structural inequalities and thus an transformative capacity. So in order to be successful, the quality of the process is crucial. So we need to ensure that the whole process is inclusive, participatory, transparent, trans representative, and democratic. So another example um, in the next slide 
It's about a better understanding integration of power and gender dynamics on resilience measurement. So this is the example of uh, the effect, uh, effectiveness review uh, that are impact evaluations that we do to assess effectiveness of programs to enhance resilience. So these evaluations use a context-specific multidimensional index of resilience capacities. So to better include power and gender dynamics into this measurement approach, we need to think about three things. First, as evaluator, who do we listen to? This is about sampling strategies, ensuring representation and visibility of women and men in different positions of power. This means opening up the household and going beyond surveying the household head or person available at the time of the visit, being intentional in hearing for both women and men. It's also about what is considered as characteristic of resilience capacities. We have switched from the household level to individual level, assuming that both levels will matter for resilience capacities. The gender lens leads to acknowledging that different aspects matter at the individual level and are shaped by power gender dynamics. So, and finally, the index of resilience capacity, capacities of women and men, conducting systemic analysis of gender differences and differential impacts of, of auction programs for women and men participants. So the last example is about embedding learning. I'm going to, to pass uh, fast uh, on that uh, for, for, for having enough time for discussion. So as we have seen by your monitoring, evaluation uh, and measurement, learning is a central element of meal in resilience programming. So this is an example of how uh, we have embed learning in one project. This is the case of the Resilience, Employment and Social Cohesion project that we conduct in chat with, uh, it's a four year program that we conduct in chat with care and action against hunger and three local partners. So learning was embedded from the concession and design of its smell system in the following ways. First, we were planning and budgeting for evidence-based learning from the beginning. We are using a theory of change and we are reflecting upon yearly using the evidence we have from ME. We use the evaluation also to identify indicators for resilience capacities and to test the hypothesis of the theory of change. The evaluation approach also uh, that we have uh, adopted facilitates reflexive, reflexive practice um, with uh, stakeholders and interpretation of resources with local uh, actors. We do annual learning workshops with improvement plans and we have plans for a learning agenda, agenda where we do also research to tackle some, uh, knowledge gaps the program had. So finally, um, you can see in the next, next slide is an overview that you can uh, of toolkits and guidance posts we have that further explore. To, uh, if you want to further explore, explore um, and go into more details about how we are doing men in resilience. And so, okay, if we move to challenges in the next slides. So there are lots of challenges we face in our MER practice. I think also my colleague from Mercy Corps has uh, stressed some of them. However, I want to focus uh, on, 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 on a few of them. The first of one is uh, context-specific understanding of assessing resilience capacities in general, and more specifically, transformative capacity. We still need to, and we still struggle to consolidate and articulate a clear concept for the three resilience capacities among teams, especially around transformative capacity. How the understanding of the context specific resilience capacities affect the problem theory of change. We need to better also to integrate environment and natural resources and higher level changes, uh, in particular formal changes in laws or policies in our mill frameworks overall and in our resilience capacity measurement framework of the effectiveness reviews. Um, and we need to improve and uh, better learn how we measure and evaluate transformative capacity in different contexts, for instance, in fragile and conflict affected contexts. Um, we, we need to continue, we have done some progress, but we need to continue to ensure gender and power lenses in resilience assessment. We need to improve the context analysis. We need to make more emphasis uh, uh, on regarding existing inequalities in program design, so we can have more transformative programs that address uh, these root causes of, of, of uh, vulnerability and risks. Uh, we need to better integrate intersectional framework and approach. 
we need to more systematically identify gender transformative outcomes and measure them in resilience programming. Um, the, the third one is about the way we learn. So um, we need to also improve how we do shorter learning loops, how we ensure voices are social, of social marginalized and excluded group are taken into account or heard into learning processes. And finally, how we learn beyond life cycles of individual projects and how we can uh, have a, a, a long-term uh, learning journey uh, in, our, um, in our interventions. Finally, um, it's about challenges related with inclusions, empowerment, and participatory methods in MIL. So this is how we are more systematic on including the voices of vulnerable and marginalized groups in our mill practice. We need to pay attention on the mill approaches and methods we are using and see how they can be supporting vulnerable and marginalized groups agency and empowerment. So I'm going to stop here. I think we have lots of information. I hope that is useful and we will have a rich discussion now. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you for that, Elsa, and thank you to people who are putting questions in the chat box. Please do keep them coming. Um, I'm going to invite Wendy now to just reflect on the presentations and maybe ask a question or two of your own, Wendy. Thank you. Um, thank you both to Jill and Elsa. That was, that was really helpful and insightful um, for all the rest of us who are also wrapping our heads around how to do resilience programming. Um, the a few takeaways that I took from each presentation. Um, uh, I thought it was really insightful and interesting to hear how Mercy Corps saw the um, the drought unfold in the Horn of Africa and how that prompted them to really examine um, what are we doing now and why is that not sufficient for avoiding these types of disasters. Um, and then how do we, you know, moving forward, how do we change that? How do we improve our programming so that we really can avoid these really terrible losses and loss of life, loss of livelihoods? Um, and the specific question she shared around that. Um, and also I, I liked seeing in both cases how um, they had kind of the timeline and the evolution of resilience programming um, generally in resilience measurement specifically in each organization and how that has really um, grown as, you know, iteratively as they've built out their capacities and their resources. Um, uh, and then also I thought it was, um, it was interesting that there were a couple um, pain points or challenges that both organizations have identified. Um, as well as there were a few that I think were more specific to each organization based on where their focus is. Um, and I thought that was really interesting to see how that plays out just a little bit differently based on the, the broader framework that they bring to resilience. Um, I have a couple notes to myself to make sure that I go back and read Mercy Corps stress um, documentation to make sure that I fully understand it. I've read it before, but um, seeing it play out in real life and, and through the story that Joel told us, I thought was really helpful um, and inspiring to, to go back and look at that again. Um, as well as to take a look at the research that, um, that Mercy Corps has, done, has been able to do because they have all this rich panel data um, to see how that's played out um, in some of their real life programming in Nepal and Ethiopia. Um, in terms of Oxfam, um, one of the notes I made to myself was uh, to definitely sign up for the podcast that Elsa mentioned. Um, that's, that's a real fun way to go about doing this that's, um, that's a little different from the, the typical sort of deep um, and sometimes dry materials that we read in, in resilience programming. So, um, so thank you. Thank you both. Um, I have uh, two questions that I'd like to ask you each. Um, one, the first question is, in what ways do you think this focus on resilience, monitoring, evaluation, and learning is impacting your agency's programming or strategy? Um, Jill, would you like to take that first? 
Yes, sure. Um, so I will just give sort of one example. So we have time for other questions. Um, so as I discussed in my presentation, Mercy Corps early on invested in um, research to, to understand and inform our thinking about what matters for building resilience in different contexts. And so one thing that we found over and over again in multiple contexts through this research was that households with strong social capital um, were able to draw on their networks to cope with shocks and stresses um, as they were happening and ended up avoiding many of the negative impacts or at least some of them um, when you compared them to households that didn't have those strong networks, those informal social safety nets. And so this is something that, you know, we recognized as important, an important piece of the resilience puzzle and something that we wanted to include in all of our programming. So because we saw, hey, a lot of households with strong social capital are doing better, we purposely design our intervention approaches to embed um, elements or activities that aim to build those networks or social capital because we know they're important. And so we wouldn't have known that um, if we hadn't invested a lot in this resilience measurement and research um, in the beginning. So just one example of how RML has translated into impacting just our strategy um, for implementing our interventions. Great, thank you. Um, Elsa, how, how has this focus on resilience MEL impacted um, Oxfam? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, um, well, I think it's the, the meal, the way we are doing meal, but as well, the the, 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 the journey Oxfam has done on, on shaping and, and framing the, the resilience approach it has impacted the way Oxfam is delivering uh, their, their programs. I just mentioned, I will mention two, two aspects. I think one of um, how our meal practice, for instance, is with the impact evaluations, but also with uh, evaluations in 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 programs or uh, by using theory of change, has put the emphasis on uh, on on understanding gender differentiation, uh, going uh, moving from just disaggregation, but understand the different differentiated. Um, capacities and how uh, interventions were uh, impacting different different groups. So I think that shed light and that give more um, uh, impacted the way we are taking more into account. I think uh, the gender dimension and uh, power dynamics. Uh, within our interventions, resilience building interventions. And as I said, in challenges, we, we have, uh, we have a, still a, a long way to go uh, and we need to still to improve the way we do that. But I think um, that the, the, the work we have been doing on resilience smell and also research around this issue about gender justice and resilience has uh, helped shape a little bit uh, our programming. And the other point I want to, to focus on is um, uh, maybe about learning. I think uh, before uh, the impression it was that uh, uh, that we stress with the, the meal guidance the importance about learning and adaptive management, and we move a little bit from just measurement measurement. So I think uh, this has allowed for programs to. Um, to be not so focused about perfect measurement tools or index or quantitative, quantitative measures maybe that were, uh, uh, that purpose maybe were more in mind of people, but also investing on learning, iterative learning and adapting the interventions uh, as, as, as they implement them. Um, yeah, I, I will maybe say these two, two things. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Wendy and Elsa and Jill. I, I just want to acknowledge that we have a number of really good questions in the chat box and some of them are related to methodologies, indicators. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that 
There are rich resources online on the measuringresilience.org website, including the proceedings from a conference we ran, an RML conference in 2018, uh, where you can read more about the different panels and the detailed discussions um, at that conference, because this is a, it's a very rich resource and, and your questions are fantastic. Um, I just wanted to pick up a question. It was a bit of a discussion in the chat box between Dr. Kagla and Simon, and it's for you, Jill, um, related to how you um, apply your sort of MEL methodology and how that helps to inform practice um, and particularly what what indicators you select to measure and evaluate um, resilience. Perhaps you could respond to that with an example. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think the maybe the best example to talk about how we sort of tested these methodologies in the field, what we observed and how we adjusted them is um, talking about the recurrent monitoring survey methodology. So again, that's the panel surveys that follow the same people over time to see sort of how they're coping and responding to shocks and stresses as they're happening. This methodology was first tried out in Ethiopia with the Horn of Africa drought through our prime project, um, which is funded by USAID. Um, and it, you know, Tango International, who's a big player in the resilience measurement space, they designed or helped to design this methodology. And so the context in which the Ethiopia drought happened, there was basically a long shock, right, um, that affected a lot of people. And so when you think about how you would sample, you know, how would you design your sampling frame and how you would determine when to measure different um, indicators, it was sort of all coming out of that context. So when we try to apply that in Asia, which has a very different shock and stress landscape, um, what we ended up finding was that most of the shocks and stresses people experience are idiosyncratic. So meaning different households and different communities experience different things. Um, and you might have pockets of um, different communities, maybe living near the river, that would experience massive flooding and maybe a couple houses over they wouldn't have that experience and so when we tried to implement the same methodology with our recurrent monitoring surveys it just didn't work um, and so we had to rethink how what how we did that or how you know how would we set that up um, and what we ended up doing which is described further and in more detail in a uh, practical guidance series that came out through um, the REAL grant, which is a resilience evaluation analysis and learning. And that there's a link to it, I think, in my presentation. Um, and it just sort of describes the different way that we had to do it in Asia, um, given that the context is different there. And so um, I hope that's enough detail. <laughs> um, but please do go and read that. It describes it all in very, like, um, minute detail. Uh, so indicators, um, similarly, you have different contexts, but you want to be able to measure things in a standardized way. Um, I will only say a couple of things about indicators. Um, it's a question I get a lot because I know it's the thing that we're responsible for in our programs. We have to report it's our accountability measures. So there isn't one indicator to measure resilience. There isn't, a re you know, if you have an indicator that says number of people who are resilient, it's, it's probably um, not the best indicator to have. So um, that's because resilience is really a method or an approach to doing, you know, your, your typical programming. And so it's sort of the means to an end. And um, on that, you know, but we do have some indicators that you can use that show various um, levels of resilience, maybe. So um, maybe, you know, we, we, most of our programs are at the very minimum able to just measure that how or what resources, so those are the resilience capacities, so what resources are people drawing on or accessing and using at different points in time. Um, we also use some subjective indicators. There's been a lot of research coming out lately about subjective resilience, um, and that's really like your confidence in the future, your, um, your feelings towards your ability to address shocks and stresses again in the future. So we use a lot of those indicators as a proxy for subjective resilience. Um, 
I think Oxfam has a quite good list of indicators that maybe Elsa can share so you can see from different organizations what people are using. Yeah, thanks um, for that, Jill. And actually, I mean, there are, there are a couple of questions coming in here, for example, around are there standard field level measurement practice and tools um, out there? And I know different organizations have talked a little bit about are there sort of minimum standards or guidance that can be offered to, pe to people and projects thinking about their resilience measurement and evaluation. Elsa, do you want to speak to that a little bit from Oxfam's experience? For, for the sorry for the indicators we use yes mm -hmm. yeah um okay so so as we as we have said and and this is we don't have a standard list of indicators so um this is uh, this is part of the context specificity of of resilience intervention so the indicators need to be identified in the moment when we are doing the context analysis and we understand what are the capacities um, that exist and need to be improved in order to, to increase resilience across uh, I am with uh, with discussions with with local uh, groups and stakeholders so um, so what we the way we we go around and what we are um, the guidance we, we give to teams is uh, we are um, we are uh, taking the six social change processes and that we are using and that we are framing at, that are the processes that uh, enable resilience capacities and to help team to identify indicators related to these different social change processes, also accounting for their specific context and what they will be working on in their intervention. So I didn't, I didn't uh, explain them uh, before, but just uh, about securing its livelihoods, uh, increased access to use and knowledge of information, accountable govern governance processes, increase gender and justice and empowerment, learning processes and innovation, and NS collective overlooking and flexible decision making. So we have uh, some also for, for people, if they can access uh, in the guide, we have example of uh, some indicators we can use refer to uh, these different uh, 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 these different processes and how they can relate to different capacities. Um, so uh, yeah, I think one of the one of the challenges we have and and what we have been also making some progress, I think, is how we can identify uh, indicators beyond. Uh, I think was a question also in the chat beyond household level. So um, we are uh, making progress to uh, say to to frame when we define our theory of change, uh, changes at different levels, not just at household or community level, but also a local level or national level, referring to changes on on policies, uh, on practice uh, at different at different levels. And so indicators should ref should uh, should refer to these different levels where we are trying to build these capacities because we we frame is the capacities of the systems, not just of the of the people themselves of, of households. I think uh, I don't know if you want more more or it's it's enough. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for that, Elsa. And I think there's a couple of questions in here also um, for you. And I think people are picking up on the challenges of really incorporating learning as a central part of, of MEL and how, how you turn learning into uh, project management and project ch uh, changing, the ch changing the interventions of a project through adaptive management. I wonder if you could reflect on that for one minute on, in Oxfam's experience. Yeah, I think this is a, a, a challenge of Oxfam and we are, um, we are uh, working on that from just not only for our resilience pyramid but in general for all our interventions so i would say that um, one of the key things is that um, teams need to see learning not as an extra charge or uh, extra work they have to do but then how they can be embedded in all the management and all the all the activities they do in managing the project and and M&E as well. It's not like just now. Okay, now we are going to do learning and we stop <laughs> and we learn and that as well. There are specific moments for for learning, but for instances, for example, embedding when we do 
uh, monitoring reports, uh, uh, so including their questions about what, what has worked, what has you learned, um, also um, embedding, um, uh, using, as I said, using theory of change. This is a, a, a change that we are trying to, to promote, so moving forward from moving from just using a lo logical framework, but uh, using the theory of change, not just for measurement or evaluation, evaluation, but also to reflect about the change pathways. So for instance, we are using it, we, we have a methodology that is a annual impact reflection with stakeholders, where we take a part of the theory of change, a specific uh, change pathway or specific uh, uh, assumption we want to or, or change we want to to see and we reflect on it with a uh, concerned stakeholders and make sense collectively of that and what we can improve one also uh, one practice that uh, also is important is um, how we how we uh, like it's not just learning within the the program team but also how we learn with uh, people that is uh, participating in both or, or the agents no the real uh, uh, the real uh, participants of, of the project, so local stakeholders, communities, etc. So when when we when we um, when we uh, include them in all these learning processes, it's more easy then for them to uh, understand changes that we make uh, to the interventions. Uh, also, local authorities maybe that um, should approve changes or should. Uh, be, implement part of the intervention or, or, or support part of the intervention if they are uh, in, uh, participating actively participating on all the learning activities or, and, and m and &E can also be more aware and more open to accept changes for instances of what we are going to do so yeah. just to mention some examples of how we can do that Okay, that's great. Thanks, Elsa. And I think it's important that we you, sometimes we're talking about uh, approaches like uh, or methodologies like sense making for people to share their understanding of change and how they're being impacted as a way of helping to adapt the project itself. I just want to pick up on maybe for you, Jill, some some questions from Dine. Um, sort of getting back into well, when we say shocks and stress, is it only to disaster or other socioeconomic shock and stresses too and also how can we demonstrate that we've built resilience in the absence of a disaster or a particular shock and I wondered if you wanted to speak to those those questions. Sure um, so I think yeah the understanding what a shock or stress is I think often we think of natural disasters or climate related shocks and stresses like drought and flooding but in a lot of the contexts that we work in, say um, in West Africa, um, their shocks and stresses are more um, conflict driven. And so it doesn't have to just be your natural disasters or um, those climate related shocks and stresses. They could be like Denis um, mentioned, um, economic or socioeconomically focused or um, conflict related. Um, these are some things, you know, that you would do, you know, a mapping of shocks and stresses with your team during the assessment phase. If you were going to sort of layer in that risk analysis to your typical assessments, um, one minimum thing that you'd want to do in a resilience focused program is to identify the major shocks and stresses that are driving vulnerability in the communities that you're working in, um, which will look different for different contexts. So how to measure resilience in the absence of a disaster? Um, this one's a tough one. And, and I'll, you know, see if Oxfam agrees, but within Mercy Corps, we sort of think of it like you can't really, you can't really demonstrate um, that people are more resilient if they're not drawing on resources to respond to shocks and stresses. And so of course, you know, in the course of a program, say it's, if it's short, if it's only two years, you might not be able to demonstrate that. Um, you might be able to demonstrate that people are ready to respond. So they have access to those key resources. So maybe savings or they have knowledge on um, disaster risk reduction, mitigation strategies, et cetera, access to clean water. Um, but, um, you know, if there isn't 
if they're not really able to demonstrate that they're using it um, to respond when it matters, um, that then you don't really know, you know, if they're resilient or not. And so oftentimes um, you sort of, you plan for, you hope that things don't happen. Um, and then that's, you know, the best case scenario is if the communities you're working with aren't um, facing these kind of horrible shocks and stresses. But I think that, um, you know, if you define your shocks and stresses a little bit more widely and not just focus on one, you'll probably find that, you know, there's things that happen within people's everyday lives, like a death in the family can be very devastating um, to an individual's household ability to, um, you know, their livelihoods. And so we try to sort of measure many different things and not just one um, to see a fuller picture. Um, so yes, good question. It's difficult. <laughs> And I think at the very minimum, you can see how people are ready to respond if they're not facing something within the lifetime of your program. Thanks, Jill. Um, we are going to wrap up now. I was just gonna ask um, Jill and Elsa if there was one question you had seen in the chat box that you would like to respond to, um, particularly and while you're looking at that, I just want to encourage people to go to the um, measuringresilience.org website and you will find the RML and practice um, section there, and you will find more information about uh, Oxfam and Mercy Corps' resilience approach. And we will be continuing to build this out um, in the next couple of months with um, other examples and uh, probably another webinar in March with other organizations and programs. And in there, you will find links to the tools and the knowledge products that both Oxfam and Mercy Corps have been developing. Um, so Elsa, would you like to just wrap up with your final comment on the question that you were looking at? I'm sorry, I was in mute. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to do some uh, reflection. One of the questions I saw in the chat that was referring about, uh, as I was saying, I'm curious to know if there a standard field level measurement practice on tools out of survey and assessment. So I just wanted to to make a reflection also as a challenge we have because uh, it's true that lots of uh, like we do lots of surveys and the resilience dynamic requires more frequent surveys so without chalks with chalks uh, and and this uh, recurring monitoring that 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 uh, Jill was uh, mentioning and and this is creating that may create a, a survey fatigue. Uh, with uh, with people, no, uh, that need to respond to all the time these uh, surveys, and also what uh, we see us in our practice now. Some sometimes we are not so good on on returning back to communities and people the results of these surveys and make the, them cl uh, clearly understandable for them, so they can use it as well. So we have just to share an experience we have, and you can find. Uh, in the meal guide about uh, a fill uh, fill tool to, that is called a spider web or monitoring resilience tool that uh, that we were using in in Vanuatu uh, so communities were identifying uh, what were the dimensions they found important for their resilience. So themselves, they identified that and that they have a, a group, a committee that was responsible to tracking advance on, on these dimensions. And, uh, and, and which are where different actors that were contributing or helping them as community to improve this different, these different dimensions of resilience. It was uh, a, a specific tool, a participatory tool that we, we used in, in this case in Vanuatu and, and Salomon Islands, I, I think. And you can find also in, in the guide to know a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thanks, Elsa. And Joel, do you have any sort of final reflections as we wrap up? Um, yes. So um, I think I'll just kind of echo the calling out of different resources. I think it can be a bit overwhelming. You know, in the beginning, you're trying to measure resilience. There's, it's, it's not easy. Um, we're, and we all feel everyone's pain with this. And especially Mercy Corps, we've, we've sort of been through very different iterations of what this looks like. And so um, I'd say, you know, the, the real 
guidance note series. Uh, the practical guidance note series, there's a link in the chat. It's a good place to start. Um, it goes over assessments um, and how to measure resilience capacities and, um, you know, and then these recurrent monitoring surveys, which is a bit of a heavier lift, but at least it could give you some ideas for some, you know, some ways to sort of slowly integrate measuring resilience into in your program. So, um, yeah, I hope we can continue the discussion and happy to follow up after the presentation if there are more questions. That's great. Thanks, Jill. And yes, just a reminder to everybody, do, do send in your questions. We've, we've tracked what you've asked on the webinar, but it's very helpful for us in terms of how we could shape future um, newsletters or organizations we could profile or webinars um, moving forward. So, for example, I just want to acknowledge that Ken McLoon has asked a, a question around are there examples or are there methodologies around looking at larger scale resilience beyond the focus on households and communities? And I mean, that, that's a really important question, obviously for many development organizations, often working in rural communities, um, looking at outcomes like food security, this has very much been a focus in the resilience measurement, evaluation and learning space. But if we look more at uh, platforms, say around city resilience, um, flood resilience, looking at, um, across different scales, landscape relationships or ecological perspectives on resilience. Um, you know, there are people who are looking at and thinking about how you both measure and learn about change in those more complex systems. And I think that's something that we would, would definitely like to pick up uh, more on in the, in, in the future webinars in the series. So I am going to stop there and say thank you all for participating. It was really incredible to see how many people registered for this. It's obviously a live topic for a lot of people. How do, how do we do this in practice and how does it affect the way that we, we work um, moving forward? Really important questions. Thank you so much to Jill and Elsa and Wendy for, um, you know, preparing for this webinar and for putting your materials online with us. And um, yeah, we will keep you informed and look forward to more of these moving forward. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks. Okay, thanks.